Hello everyone, it's KE7VLC Orion here for the Mesa Amateur Radio Club, Whiskey Mike 7, Romeo Charlie. Just going to uh, do a, uh, basically an opening of a package. If everyone has ever, um, taken a look at our website as of lately, you'll see that we have a, um, and I'll do a little sc uh, screen share here in just a second here. Let me, let me grab our website back up. Um, our website has a cafe press, um, uh, basically store where you can purchase Mesa Amateur Radio Club logoed items. Uh, it's it's you know it's a little on the expensive side, but the the nice thing is is the money actually uh, part of the money actually comes to back to us. Um, uh, you know, for club use and everything of that nature, help us offset some of our, uh, you know, our yearly costs, our our website and uh, um, our domain costs, our mailbox and stuff, uh, and so on and so forth. And so I wanted to uh, take a little bit of time and share this with you. Um, let me go over here. Okay, so now uh, you'll you'll see our um, our website. Um, happy holidays. Um, you know, that's coming up here. We got uh, Thanksgiving coming up. Uh, we already had uh, Veterans Day, so to all those veterans out there, you know, uh, thank you for your service. Um, and even the ones that are serving right now that are watching our videos, you know, thank you for your service as well. Um, but tonight I was going to do just a short little video on a uh, on our Cafe Press uh, uh, area here. So if you come up here to the Mesa Amateur Radio Club uh, website here and then you scroll down, You'll see, visit our swag shop right down here. Click on it, it comes over here to uh, our Cafe Press um, shop. Now we got t-shirts, uh, we have, well, we do have a cute little teddy bear. Uh, we have a couple mugs, uh, some pint glasses. Uh, we do have a clock, um, you know, a mouse pad if you're interested in that. Um, it's it's kind of a nice little shop. and and. So uh, what I wanted to do is I bought an item off of here, and I wanted to take you through a little bit of the process. It's actually not that difficult. Um, you know, you click on the item that you want, you choose the um, the the size, you go to the cart, and you put in your credit card information and everything. It takes about it took me about two weeks to actually get my item uh, shipped to my house over here. Uh, not very. Not not bad at all. I think it's kind of a, um, a nice little feature that we have. A little way of uh, for you to kind of uh, donate to, to the club without actually donating. Um, uh, I don't know the specifics as to how much we actually get from this, um, and we're still uh, in uh, in the works of trying to figure that out. Um, and as soon as Chad has all that information, I'll I'll definitely pass it on to you. Uh, anyways, you know, feel free to you know scout around in here and if you find something that you want uh, go right ahead and order it um, it is uh, you know it does uh, cost a little bit on the shipping but uh, uh, again uh, it helps out with the club's cost so I wanted to do a, uh, an, un an unboxing of sorts tonight um, just kind of uh, show you what the item uh, what the item looks like uh, when it when it arrives it's gonna come in a little package like this or maybe a box or something um, and so I, I'm just gonna go right ahead and break this open um, let's, let's just go right ahead and rip this open and see what we got <clears throat> so I got the zipped up hoodie shirt now I haven't opened this up I haven't looked at this or even tried it on but um, Here's what the uh, the sweatshirt looks like. I'll kind of lay it out here so you guys can all see and everything. Um, it's got our logo up there. Nice little zipper. So let's uh, we'll cut over to a camera of me, and we'll give it a try and see what we see what it's like. Um, let's see here. go so it's a standard Hanes sweatshirt this is an extra large so just for those of you who 
want to see what the size looks like. This is an extra large. Um, very nice shirt. I like it. Um, so let's see. Looks pretty nice. Looks nice. Looks decent. Um, I mean, it looks pretty nice and everything. I, I like it. It's got the pockets and everything. Nice little zip up hoodie. So when I go camping, especially for winter field day, I'll be sporting it, especially during the daytime. Uh, nighttime is a little different. We might have to break out the, uh, the Arctic parkas or something. But uh, I wanted to share that with you guys. Take a look at it a little more. Let's step back a little bit here. And... It's not, not bad at all. It's got the Mesa Amateur Radio Club logo on there. It's nice. I mean, it's not like it's a peel-on or a patch or anything like that. It's actually, they've done a really good job of, looks like silk screening it in there and everything. So uh, I'm pretty happy with it. Not a, not a bad item there. So if you're interested and you want to help out the club a little bit, uh, feel free to take a look around and see uh, if there's a you know sweatshirt or a shirt that you would like, um, you know, or a mug. Uh, we might have to buy a couple of these mugs and maybe raffle them off or something like that, or maybe use them as an award for, you know, um, first contact or something like that. So I just thought I would at least share and let you guys take a look at it and see what you guys think. And uh, if you have any comments, you know, go right ahead and comment down below. Um, please subscribe to our channel or our YouTube channel so that uh, whenever we do an update or create a new video or come out with something new uh, you get notified of it um, also please comment down below see what you guys think uh, and as soon as I get more information as to how much we get back from it I'll, I'll pass that along to you guys um, anyways this is KE7VLC uh, for the Mesa Amateur Radio Club WM7RC uh, I'm going to sign out. 73, everyone. Hello, everyone. This is KE7VLC for the Mesa Amateur Radio Club doing another little short educational video. Um, today's agenda is um, repeaters. We're going to talk about repeaters. And uh, specifically, I know a while back I had asked... Um, I had informed everybody that I was going to teach you a little bit on how to program the FT60R. Um, this is my favorite radio for public service events. Um, there's several reasons why. Uh, one of the reasons why is the battery case. Uh, it, come, it can come with, you can buy a AA carrier um, carrying case or AA carrying case for the back of it. Um, if I was to open this uh, up let me see here let me let me open it up here really quick here if I was to open this up and remove the I got double A's in it there's a reason why I went with double A's rather than the standard like the FT70R has a rechargeable battery on it there's a reason why I didn't do that with the FT60 and the reason uh, that that reason is is because in the field or an emergency situation, you may not be able to charge your batteries. You may not have electricity where you're going to be at. And so if you only have one of those rechargeable batteries, guess what? Once that battery is dead, you're out of service. You are no longer useful to anybody. Um, so I went with a double A carrier uh, primarily because you can find double A's anywhere. In an emergency situation, you could, as, uh, you know, I don't really advocate this doing this during a non-emergency situation, but you could break into a, uh, uh, a department store or a, a grocery store or a gas station or something like that, and they have AA batteries. Uh, if you're on a public service event and you're driving down the road and your batteries go dead, you could always stop over at a gas station or a grocery store or even a local pharmacy and pick up double A's pretty easily. So that has that going for it. And 
it's also fairly rugged. I mean, I'm not going to say that I'm going to drop this off of a, uh, uh, a six-foot cliff or something like that onto a whole bunch of rocks down below. I'm not going to dunk this in uh, a river or a creek or anything like that because it's not waterproof. But it's actually a fairly decent radio. This is my original radio. This is the first radio I purchased with my own money. And <laughs> it sounds funny, but it was $180 back then. I know nowadays everybody's going, oh, I want to get a Baofeng. You can just get a Baofeng. They're cheap. They're $35 off of Amazon. Just get a cheap uh, battery or a cheap radio. The problem with going with a Baofeng radio is... It's not easily to be. It's not easy to be programmed in the field on the go uh, when you need it. Uh, a lot of hams end up pre-programming their uh, Baofeng radios and using Chirp to uh, program it with all the frequencies uh, prior to the event. Well, that's good, but what if they needed to change to a different frequency that was not on that uh, com plan or? or in an emergency situation, they decide, well, you know what, this specific frequency is getting interfered with. Let's change over to another frequency. Now you've got the problem of having to break out your laptop, break out your cables, and reprogram your radio in the field. So I highly recommend that everybody learn how to program their radio from the face of the radio without using the computer. The FT60R, and I'm going to demonstrate that here in a bit, is very simple. It's like six or seven button pushes and you're done all right so the ft70 is a very similar radio it's got the buttons on the front and you can program this directly from here uh, which is the nice thing i do not recommend dmr radios or digital radios to new hams get an fm analog radio and learn how to use a repeater through an analog first because the basics of doing that, because that is the basics of everything, the, the basis of everything that you're going to need to know, is through the analog FM repeaters. DMR has a very similar setup, but there's a few other little extra little gizmos that you got to throw in there, little extra little programming tricks that you got to put into it before it's functional. Uh, you know, setting the uh, the specific time slot and stuff of that nature, and that typically gets a lot of people frustrated, and if you w follow any of the uh, DMR forums, Facebook pages, uh, Reddit pages, you're going to find a lot of people, especially new hams, sitting there going, I'm about ready to just give up on this whole entire DMR thing. It's Why is it so frustrating? And it's, it's, it's because hams are trying to take something that was made for commercial use and put it into the ham radio use. Perfectly acceptable, but unfortunately there's a huge steep learning curve with it. A lot of the commercial DMR radios are set it and forget it type things where you have one person who specifically programs every, all the company radios to the exact same image every single time and then they just hand you a radio and out the door you go. For clubs, that might not be a bad idea. But in an emergency situation, are you going to have DMR access? And the answer might be no. Um, I use DMR uh, from my hotspot because I can't even reach the DMR repeater from here uh, very well, I should say. I'm going to caveat that with a very well. If I go outside and I kind of stand up on my back wall a little bit, I can actually reach the DMR repeater from my house and I can do a very good job. It's not saying that the repeater is that far away it's saying that the sensitivity of the digital component of the DMR is very very critical if digital it's either all or nothing so either a you're receiving every little bit of digital pro, uh, sound coming from that uh, from that radio or you're receiving none of it uh, with an FM radio with an analog radio it might come in a little bit on the scratchy side but it's still, you're still able to hear what the person is saying. Um, next time you listen in on a, a public service event, uh, listen. Uh, you'll hear people that are right, right on the fringes of hitting the repeater, and they're still able to make it. But in the digital world, if you're on the fringes of that di uh, that repeater, you're not going to make it. It'll it'll simply reject your signal, and you just can't get through. So 
you got to be thinking about that. And so for a new ham, my recommendation is start with analog and then work your way up. As you get a more experience, uh, you know, you'll start learning how to do other advanced uh, functions. Um, my recommendation is to get the FT60, less frustration, doesn't take a lot of time. And if you looked at the actual handbook, the manual that came with it, it's much thicker than the Baofeng's manual. But the key to a lot of these radios is not just basically how do I program it, it's basically keep playing with it, keep trying it out, reset the radio, go back and reprogram your frequencies in there, play with it, t test it out, try it. Um, I didn't start learning how to actually use this until like almost like four or five months after I got it. Um, that was when I started to basically play around with all the different frequencies and figure out exactly what repeaters I wanted in there. And I would reset the radio. I went back and reprogrammed, physically reprogrammed every single memory channel in my FT60R. I am happy to say that I have never cloned it. I have never used any computer software to program it. Would I like to? Yeah, sure. But quite honestly, I know how to do it, and I can do it pretty darn quick. Uh, let me give you an example of uh, one instance where I was able to program the radio pretty quick. Uh, I was out hiking on a public service event with one other with one other uh, technician, one other guy. And this guy has got a lot of experience with radios, um, but he's just recently become a new ham, uh, a ham radio operator. And we were out getting ready to go up to our spot on the trail for the Highline Trail Run. He has identical radio to mine, the FT60R. And both of us were sitting there at the uh, at the car, getting our backpacks on and uh, making sure we had our water and our food and all that other uh, medical gear and stuff of that nature. And both of us said, okay. We were both hearing traffic on the radio. We thought everything was all hunky-dory. All right. We started hiking up the trail, and we were in a valley, so we couldn't hit the repeater all that well uh, at that low level because uh, we had a ridge line that was in between us and the repeater. And it doesn't matter if you have a digital radio, analog radio, or anything like that. If you've got a mountain blocking it, you're not going to hit it, all right? Plain simple. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the key components to what a re uh, repeater is. I'm not going to go in depth into every single little piece of equipment and what each and every single little, you know, what the lightning arrestor does and things of that nature. I'm going to leave it at a very, very high level, and then I'm going to drill into how to program these radios. Um, I'm not going to show you the alluance because that's a special, special case. That's another one that if you're new to a ham radio, don't bother with. Wait until you get your feet wet. Wait until you've got experience underneath your belt and then start proceeding with all the other uh, all the extra bells and whistles that you can do with ham radio matter of fact i don't even recommend you even purchase a baofeng radio until you are feeling comfortable with being able to get on the ra on your radio program a, a frequency program a repeater program a simplex frequency and communicate effectively every single time then once you've got that capability once you've got that confidence in knowing what you are doing then step into the arena of go and get a Baofeng radio or something like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, what a repeater is. I'm going to give you some online res resources and then I'm going to show you how to program a simplex frequency and then a duplex frequency or a repeater frequency into the FT60R and then I'm going to switch over to the FT70 and I'm going to show you this, uh, the same steps. Um, show you how the, how much similar they are uh, in at least the steps in programming it, which is nice. And this is the reason why I always recommend the major three radio, uh, Kenwood, ICOM, and Yesu, because all three of them are similar in their programming, similar in their uh, menus, and <clears throat> if you can program one, you can program them all. Let's start with what a repeater is. All right, so we're going to transition over. Right, so here is essentially what <clears throat> you've got simplex, which is at the very, very bottom. It's just basically transmit frequency and an RX frequency are the same. All right, that's very, very simple. I'm hoping that all of you understand that. Just basically it's simple transmission. All right, repeaters are a different animal. 
they've got a transmit frequency and a receive frequency. Basically, you're transmitting on the transmit frequency. It's repeating what you are saying out the receive frequency so that everybody else that's on the same receive frequency can hear you. Now, there's a reason uh, behind this. Um, because if you're transmitting at the exact same time, nobody else can transmit. So now the nice thing is, is you can have a little bit of mixture. You can have multiple people chiming in at the exact same time. Now, your receiver is going to receive one of those frequencies or one of those other transmissions at the, you know, at the exact same time as everybody else. And one of them is going to override all the others. But the nice thing about doing this is, it is at the exact same time that you are speaking into the repeater, it is coming out the repeater at the exact same time. So that's very, very super critical to understand that there is a transmit frequency and a receive frequency. And they're both different. They're both uh, on this, usually on the same band. Uh, your radio, when you're programming it, you're programming it for the receive frequency, not the transmit frequency. Inside the radio, it'll automatically change when you hit the push to talk button. It'll automatically do the conversion for you and push out the uh, on the transmit frequency. So let's look at what a repeater looks like. Now this is a little more complicated repeater. It's got both a VHF and a UHF repeater. So essentially somebody can be on the 442, somebody else can be on the, the 2 meters, and they can both be hearing each other even though they're on different bands. And that's because of the crossband coupler there. So essentially what you've got is the, the two different antennas. And you're, you're going to need two different antennas for this type of a, uh, a transmitter. Um, primarily because you're going to need one that's a UHF and one that's VHF. If it's just the VHF, you don't necessarily need the, the second antenna um, because of the duplexers. So what happens is, is everything comes in on the antenna, it goes through, this one goes through the, the coupler, comes down, um, obviously there's a lightning arrestor. Uh, if you don't know what a lightning arrestor does, it basically stops lightning from traveling down even further. It basically is a blown fuse at that point in time. Everything above it might get fried, but everything down below should be protected. So that's what a lightning arrestor does. Um, we're not going to go in depth into how it does it and things of that nature. So in here, there's another crossband coupler. Okay, one goes UHF and one goes VHF, and then you've got what they what these things are called are duplexer cans, and this is this is a, a, a fairly expensive piece of equipment. The mo the most expensive piece of equipment is going to be the power supply and the actual controller itself, um, or the repeater radio uh, equipment. So you got this duplexer comes in here. Um, I'm not going to go in depth as to how the duplexer works. That's going to be for another day. Um, and I'll let somebody who actually fully understands exactly how a duplexer works. Um, they're specifically tuned to your specific frequency. So it's not like you can take a can, uh, take the duplexer out of one and go over to another and hook it up. You're going to have to get it retuned for that specific frequency. So, and then you've got it coming in, you've got to receive, and then you've got transmit. If you look at this here, you've got receive and transmit. Oh gee, didn't we just go over that in this one? Ah, transmit and a receive. If we look at this, if somebody's transmitting, hits the am antenna, comes down, goes into the duplexer. Okay, so now it's coming in on the receive frequency because it's receiving it. All right, comes down through, hits the radio here, who then basically sends it back out on the transmit side. So you've got the transmit side coming back up, traveling through the duplexer. Um, the duplexer basically allows bo both um, both receive and uh, transmit to be on the same, and it'll automatically figure out exactly which one is which. I'm not going to go into the duplexer again. Um, and then it comes back out the antenna. Now that would be one side of it. This one gets a little more complicated because it's got a UHF repeater built into it as well. So it comes into the uh, to similar duplexers, goes into the receive side, comes back down into the radio, and then it kicks back out. All right. 
Now this, on this particular one, it is happening at basically the exact same time. So that's, that's also really, really nice. Now down here you have the repeater controller. This one has uh, All-Star and Echo Link linked into it. So somebody on Echo Link from their computer at home could actually hit the space bar and input themselves into the exact same repeater. All right, very cool. Um, this also does the CW IDing, the voice ID, the courtesy tones, the control, the linking, the macros, everything. This is what controls what the repeater actually does. Um, so this is the brains of the whole entire thing. Uh, this one comes over through a private IP uh, network, um, comes over to another repeater controller and can basically cross control here. Uh, matter of fact, looks like what they can do is they can take one repeater out of out of the whole entire system and use it for something totally different without interfering with the other one. So let's say it's a local bike race. They can actually take the UHF off this whole entire frequency and just use the VHF side without interfering with anybody else using the UHF side. That's pretty brilliant. That's actually really, really smart and really, really nice. Uh, not everybody's got the capability of this. The Arizona Repeater Association has systems like this. Um, you'll hear them saying, well, this one isn't on the linked system anymore. Um, so you'll have to find another repeater in the linked system and use that instead of this specific repeater. Essentially what they have done is they've severed the links to all the other repeaters from that one repeater, and they're able to do it for local... Um, you know, bike race or a run or something like that and keep the other frequency and the other link system back up and running so others can still use that link system without interfering of, with that specific bike race. Um, just basically very courteous. Now, uh, they may or may not necessarily have the capability of doing this or they may not. So you always, uh, the first rule of repeaters, anytime you're going to get on the radio, is listen, 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 and just keep on listening. All right? Don't just basically turn it on and then hit the micro or hit the push to talk button and just put your call sign out there because you might be interfering with a public service event. Um, you might be uh, interfering with another QSO that's going on or something like that. Uh, it's one of my little repeater etiquette. Um, pet peeves is when people just basically jump on there and start kerchunking the repeater or just immediately put their call sign out there without actually listening. And yes, that has happened. So now let's go back to my story because <laughs> I got sidetracked. That's that's what happens in Orion world, all right? Orion goes choop, choop, every which direction, all right? So what happened is, is we were getting ready to hike up this trail and um, we got up to a certain um, certain level uh, where we could actually hit the other repeater where, or hit the repeater. And his radio was silent, but mine was crackling with a whole bunch of traffic because net control was passing information back and forth between other stations, other aid stations, uh, mobile drivers, coordinating a couple things. And my radio was just constantly going, just basically one thing after another, and his was silent. And so he was like, hold on one second, something's wrong with my radio. And I, you know, at first he thought, oh, my, boy, you know, my radio is broken or my antenna is broken. That ended up being not the case, all right, because uh, the, the very first step in any troubleshooting is start with the basics and work your way up. So we immediately took a look at it, made sure that the squelch was uh, adjusted properly. And then I looked down and I noticed that he was on a different frequency, all right. Um, he had looked at the comm plan and thought that the frequency that he was on was the main net and that the other one was the backup net, and he didn't have the backup net programmed into his radio. Well, it turned out that the frequency that I was on was actually the main net, and the frequency that he was on was actually the backup net. So we had to actually program his radio with the main net in it. Um, Again, this was somebody not taking the time to look and read through the whole entire comm plan nights before, days before the actual event happened, and then figuring out exactly what was what and programming it into the radio. The thing was, he didn't know how to program his radio. He didn't know how to properly put it in 
in the front. He had always done it through the computer. So he was at a disability. He was not capable of field programming his radio. Now, it could have been the entire event, we could have been just using my radio, but what good does it do for two people to be out there using one radio? It does you no good. We both have a couple radios, but he was on the wrong frequency. So we had a we had to program this uh, this radio for the proper frequency. All right. Now he didn't know how to do it. He's never programmed it from the front. I did because that's all I've ever done with my radio is program it through the front controls. I've never programmed this using a computer, and I've never ever cloned it. So I I go here. Let me have your radio really quick. I grabbed his radio. I set up the appropriate frequency. I got the tone in there, the squelch in there, and all this other stuff, the repeater offset and everything. I got it all programmed in there, and I even programmed it to one of his memory channels, and it took me less than five minutes to do. Once we got that all on there, we were all like, let's test it out, make sure that it's working properly. So he keyed up, put his call sign out there, and Net Control came back and said, yeah, go ahead. And he goes, well, we're just testing our radio. We wanted to make sure that my radio was programmed properly. And, uh, you know, uh, we're, you know, still en route to our, uh, to our spot. And Net Control came back and says, yep, I can hear you perfectly fine. You guys are hitting the uh, repeater perfect. Thank you. And then he moved on. Um, so the, the lesson learned is learn how to program your radio from the face of your radio. If you cannot figure out how to do that, then my recommendation is sit down some, someday and program frequency after frequency after frequency after frequency into it until you get to know how to do it. I can do it from memory. That's how, that's how many times I program this thing. So, all right, so now that we've got that out of the way, we kind of understand exactly how to you, you know, how a repeater sort of works and everything. We'll go back here. Basically, this guy's transmitting, this guy's listening. All right, so he comes out on the transmit frequency. The repeater then sends it out on the receive frequency. Everybody on the ground all the way around this mountaintop is now hearing him. Okay, now when he switches back, he lets go of the push to talk mic. It's now going into receive mode. So now this guy over here now goes, oh, I want to transmit. So he pushes the push to talk. He comes out on the transmit frequency. The repeater hears it, sends it back out the RX frequency, and he can hear it as well. So, so now let's go into some online resources here. And I'm going to start locally first, here with Arizona. I love this website. Um, I don't understand why everybody goes tells everybody, I'll oh, just do repeater book, repeater book, repeater book. Okay, there's nothing wrong with repeater book. But if you're in the Arizona uh, area, go to the azrepeaters.net website. This is key. Um, this, it, it's got your repeater etiquette. Here's, you know, how to start a QSO via directed call, starting a QSO via monitoring call. Joining a QSO in progress. All right, there's a, there's a lot of information here. Here's even how to crossband. Oh shoot, I'm let me transition over. I forgot all about that. Sorry, I apologize. So azrepeaters.net. This is my favorite website for Arizona, and I'm going to start locally because I'm in Arizona. So if you look over here in the main menu, you've got several different things. You can contact them. You can sign the guest book. Um, editors about us. Links we like. Um, statewide inactive repeater watch list. Um, this is this is kind of interesting because these are repeaters that have been assigned, but nobody's really verified whether or not they actually exist or not. They are currently on the coordinator list, and they're unknown. Uh, like this one right here, where it says it's a paper repeater. Okay, so somebody up in Prescott, KC7TIL has requested the use for this specific frequency, the 145.390, up in Prescott area. The reason why it says it's a paper repeater is because this person has not actually fulfilled the request of actually building the repeater. He's requested the frequency pair so that nobody else can interfere with his frequency repair. It's basically it's a first come, first serve type thing. So he's already went out and requested this specific frequency pair. Now, I don't know where he is at in his repeater building. 
I don't even know where, you know, does he have a plan as to where he's going to put the transmitter? Does he, does he actually own the equipment or anything like that? Now, I don't know how long. Um, here's the ARCA, uh, ARCA policies regarding paper repeaters. You can always look at that. Unknown. Apparently, he's built this guy right here, K7MCH, has built the repeater. It's been on or something of that nature, but they don't know the status of it. And it's because either it's not linked up with another repeater repair or it's been reported down or nobody knows exactly what the status is. So if there's anybody listening in on this uh, this video here in the Golden Valley area, if you guys know whether or not this repeater is on, you know, go right ahead and comment down below, down, uh, down in our YouTube video. Let us know whether or not you've heard this repeater on the uh, on the air or not. Same way with this Mount Lemon one from KC0LL. Um, you know, it uh, this m might be at normal normal operating levels and working properly now. They don't know. So these are the little things where if you go down here and you sign the guest book, you can always let them know. Or if you reach out and you contact them saying, hey, listen, I was just on that repeater. Yes, it is working. Um, go right ahead and let them know. All right. Um, the more that they know, the better the list looks and the more hams utilize these repeaters. Um, I have a little bit of an issue with paper repeaters. Um, especially if a paper repeater has been sitting there for say uh, over a year uh, I, I mean it's gonna take a little bit of money to get a repeater and to build a repeater so I understand that you know you don't want to buy the equipment unless you know you're gonna get the repeater frequencies um, so yes I do see the reason for requesting the the frequency pair so that when you get the uh, the duplexer set up and and programmed to, uh, by a professional, it's done to that specific frequency. So that's that's the reason why I'm a year or two, maybe three years. I I I would say beyond three years or beyond four years. If you haven't built that repeater yet, you've uh, then quite honestly you need to relinquish that uh, that frequency pair until you know whether or not you're going to have the money to do it. So that's just my little quirk on it. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything to comment. If you do, please comment down below. Uh, we love comments. We love feedback. Um, in here, so coping with malicious interference. There's a lot of co uh, a lot of malicious interference. One of them that I um, kind of loathe is the kerchunkers. I, I hate um, people just kerchunking the repeater, kerchunking the repeater, re uh, kerchunking, kerchunking, kerchunking. It's, uh, you know, I don't mind, okay, if you do it once, um, okay, fine. You know, if you turn your radio on and you want to make sure that you're within the repeater range, I, personally, I'm not going to I'm not gonna yell at you or I'm not going to turn you into the FCC. But if you keep doing it over and over and over and over and over again, it gets to be annoying. And anyway, I'm not going to discuss that. If you need to know how to... Uh, you know, report uh, interference, come in here, report it, please do. Um, because the, the more that we report it, the more that they can look into it, the, the faster that they can track this person down. Ham radio is self-policing. We're, we're not waiting for an FCC official to come out here and, you know, there's no FCC official listening in on every single frequency for malicious interference. We are the ones who need to be forefront at fighting malicious interference all right so if you hear somebody doing something like jamming somebody um you know let let the the ara know let uh, the arizona repeaters know because the more that they know the more uh the more information that they know the more they can track it down and figure out exactly who it is um, and then that way they can turn it into the fcc and get the fcc to s send that person a cease and desist letter all right um, if you are somebody who keeps jamming somebody and you're watching my video, shame on you. Okay. I'm going to say that shame on you. Uh, if we, if I do catch you, I will be turning you into the FCC. No ifs, ands, or uh, buts about it. All right. Now let's go on. Um, how to use amateur repeaters. Here's uh, a page on how to actually utilize a repeater. 
Um, K7 AGE, great, great videos, by the way. If you ever get a chance to watch his videos, do so. Um, but here's just basically a simple, uh, simple process of, you know, simple information as to what a repeater is. So if you're really that interested, please step on here, take a look at it. All right. Crossband repeating. It comes in useful, comes in very useful when you're on a off, off grid situation where you might have a, a radio that's capable of doing say 50 watts and your little HT is only a, capable of doing 5 watts. Uh, cross, cross banding is very, very, uh, very handy. All right. So let's talk about, um, let's see here. Let's talk about what repeaters we have in the, uh, the realm here. All right. So on this Arizona repeater page, you can do it by county. Okay, you got Apache, Cochise, uh, Coconino, Gila. You know, obviously you can tell exactly where I, where I, you know, roam a lot of times. Coconino, Gila, Maricopa, uh, Maricopa counties. I, you know, basically uh, Pinal should be on here too, but I rarely go into the Pinal area and very rarely go into Pima. But these guys right through here, Yavapai, Coconino, Gila, Maricopa, Pinal, and Pima are going to be ones that you're going to really be paying attention to. Um, all the rest <laughs> you may or may not necessarily need. So that's the reason why they have it broken down. Now they also have it statewide by specific bands, okay, 10 meters, 6 meter. Yes, there are 10 meter repeaters. Well, one that we know of, and it's in an unknown status. So we don't know whether or not it's actually working or not. Um, if we go back here, we got 6 meter. All right, there's quite a there's there's few six meters is not really popular uh, as a repeater. I don't know necessarily know why, but uh, then you've got the statewide two two uh, zero megahertz, so one point two five centimeters. This one's another not so popular. There's quite a few of them here. Um, the radio equipment itself is a specialized equipment. You kind of sort of have to uh, find, uh, I think Bridgecom makes 220 gear. Uh, Linko might make it. I don't think that Yesu makes it, and I don't think Kenwood or Icom make it. So you're going to have to kind of go at, at a little offset with that. Um, you'll have to be digging around for some 220. 900 megahertz is usually uh, Motorola equipment, specialized uh, Motorola equipment modified by hams to get on the nine, uh, 900 megs. Uh, same way with the 1200 meg uh, range here. Um, a lot of these are going to be amateurs on TV. So the ATV network, um, the ATN uh, amateur TV is going to be all in the uh, 23 centimeter band. Uh, I like, I would love to be able to get into ATV. I just don't know if I'm going to have the time or the equipment to do so. But then we have statewide simplex frequencies, okay? So here's uh, here are all the different simplex frequencies that the coordinators uh, kind of agree on. Um, my recommendation is come in here and take a look and then program your radio with these frequencies, especially if you do a lot of uh, public service events. These 446, 025, and 050, and 070 are utilized very regularly for public service events here in the state. So my recommendation is come in and get these frequencies programmed in as well as a couple of these. Don't forget the 146.520 is the simplex calling frequency, all right? Um, do not forget that. Matter of fact, my recommendation is monitor it. Um, let's see here. We go back here to the regular. Okay, so now, like I've said, we do have some DMR frequencies, all right? So here's all the DMR uh, frequencies, repeater frequencies, notice that most of them are all in the 440s. Uh, there's a specific reason for that because they just, uh, the 440 does a really good job with digital radio uh, application. Um, obviously, a lot of these are on the uh, AZ Turbo Net. Um, don't forget, you got to deal with the time slots. You got time slots for each one of these. Um, this is the reason why I reckon I don't recommend new hands getting into DRM until you've had got your feet wet with how to program things because it gets a little on the complicated side. We've got the system fusion, which is the FT70R or the FT70D radio. 
uh, my brand spanking new radio. Thank you to the Superstition Amateur Radio Club for doing the Super Fest because that's where I won this radio. This was the door prize, all right? Um, so there were thousands and thousands of tickets handed out. I don't know how many for the uh, the door prize. There's quite a few people who stuck around for it. The door prize can only be won by somebody there. Uh, whereas the other prizes, you didn't have to actually be on site um, to win. So yes, I did win. I have not made a successful uh, fusion contact just yet. I'm still playing around with it. I still want to get my uh, grasp, my head around it before I actually start doing anything with it. Shouldn't be that much more difficult, but I, I want to have an understanding of it before I actually go down that path. But here's some system fusion. Now, a lot of these are going to be capable of handling both analog and digital. Um, so go right ahead and program some of these frequencies in and utilize it. Um, if you hear somebody out there on it, feel free to speak up. We do have D-Star in the state. There's quite a few of them, as you can see. So those of you who have an ICOM radio uh, with D-Star capability, you're going to want to really start going down this path and start looking at this. Uh, I'm going to talk about Repeater Book because Repeater Book covers the entire, um, I think it worldwide. Yeah, it's worldwide. I don't use Repeater Book all that much. Uh, not really too certain as to why. I think it's because I don't really travel outside of the state of Arizona all that much. Um, but if you're from out of state, if let's say you're from, uh, say, Nebraska, for example, uh, you can come in here and actually search exactly, you know, what repeaters are in Nebraska or Kansas, Kentucky, Maine, Alaska, whatever. Uh, this is where I would go in order to find those frequencies. Now there is a uh, advanced repeater search on here. If you uh, you got the advanced for North America, you got travel for North America, you got proximity in North America. Um, these are criteria searches. So you could do a quick search. So if you already know exactly what city you're going to be in, you can come to the quick search and search for that. Or if you know you're going to be in, say, Texas, um, you can go to the quick search. Okay, quick search comes up here. It's going to tell you, okay, I need the system fusion repeaters. Um, you know, okay, these are for in New Mexico. Okay, so here's the system fusion repeaters in New Mexico. There's one in Alamogordo. Uh, there's one in Grants, um, so you can come in here. I've got this set for New Mexico, and there was a reason why, and I can't remember why. I think it was because I was looking at the I-40 uh, route. Um, if you go into the advanced repeater search, you can come in here and search for, say, all of Florida, and hit submit, and it's going to come up with every single repeater in Florida. Ta -da. Now you can search by uh, county, you can search by location. Okay, so if I know I'm going to be in uh, uh, Big Pine Key in Monroe, Florida, I can come in here. Now I, got, now I can see that I have at least three frequencies here that I can use. Uh, Boca Raton, uh, Florida, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, if you step back out of here, you can always choose, okay, what band? So let's say I want all six meter repeaters in Florida. We'll go down that path, all right, see how many there are. Oh, yeah, there's quite a few here. It's quite interesting. Um, six meters seems to be quite prevalent in Florida. That's that's pretty darn cool. Um, so you can come in here and do the, uh, the, the, uh, the advanced repeater search. My recommendation is you get to know it. Uh, get to know it before you actually need to use it. Uh, one of the other things that I do like about the repeater book is this thing called travel. Uh, it's a travel search. So the one example I pulled up was the I-40. The I-40 crosses northern Arizona, and I've traveled the I-40 uh, several times uh, in the past couple years, um, going back to visit family and friends and stuff. And this is one place that I came to find information. However, one caveat is this is not necessarily going to be inclusive of every single repeater in the area. I'm just going to say that outright, outright right now. 
and I'll show you the show you the reason why. We're going to do I-40, and uh, if I come over here and I go, let's go to Google. I'm going to do Google Maps here really quick because I'm going to show you where the I-40 is. I think almost all of you know what the I-40 looks like. I-40 stretches from Bakersfield all the way across, up through Flagstaff, Williams, Air, uh, Winslow, Holbrook, goes up through Albuquerque, comes across Santa Rosa, Tucumcari, uh, Amarillo, uh, Oklahoma City, comes across Fort Smith, all the way down into Little Rock, comes over to Memphis, goes up through Jackson, Nashville, all the way over into Knoxville, um, comes Looks like it dips down into northern uh, side of Charlotte, um, Chapel Hill, Raleigh, uh, and then it dumps out into Wilmington, North Carolina. All right, so memorize that whole, all those cities, every single one of those. There's going to be a test at the end of them. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyways, so it passes across a couple of these. Uh, New Mexico is a big one. Arizona is a big one. Now, if you do the travel search by the I-40 and we hit search, uh, this is the reason why I don't really recommend you think that this is the end of all um, for this specific thing. If we click on state, notice there is only one in Arizona. But if you come down here, there is none in New Mexico. Now, is that because there's no repeaters in New Mexico? Is that because there's only one repeater up in Kingman, Arizona for the I-40? Well, if you actually came back here to the Arizona repeaters and hit Coconino, everybody knows that Flagstaff is up in Coconino. you got Mount Eldon right here. you got two repeaters right there. You've got uh, Flagstaff right here. This is, this is one downtown Flagstaff. Um, you've got Forest Lakes, um, may not necessarily be part of this, but you've got several on Mount Elman, uh, or Mount Eldon, I should say. Um, so if you knew that Mount Eldon was just north of Flagstaff or um, near Flagstaff, wouldn't that mean that this is incorrect for Arizona? So this is the reason why I don't necessarily say rely on this information. My recommendation is go in here and look for, um, you know, Arizona starts with an A or Ryan, come on. Um, we'll go in here and look at two meters, Arizona. Um, we'll look up Flagstaff and see if it actually pulls anything up. Okay, so there's quite a few. You got Mormon Mountain and Mount Eldon in Coconino, Arizona, Flagstaff area. So this should be more inclusive. There should be a lot more in here. Now, we definitely know that in New Mexico, there's got to be a lot more, um, a lot more uh, type of repeater. And that's what I was doing is I was searching New Mexico, and I was doing uh, two meters. Um, and if we look up location, okay, and we come down here to Albuquerque. Look at all these in Albuquerque, okay? There's a 147.74, 146.92. These are all open repeaters in the Albuquerque area. So this isn't quite tell you everything here, all right? I mean, there's a long list here in North Carolina, um, but the one thing that I definitely wanted to show you was there is a way to plot this out on Google Maps, right? So you click on the Google Maps, and this is the reason why I definitely know that there's a lot more repeaters in Arizona and New Mexico along the I-40 route that is not listed here. Because um, if you look here, if you control zoom, are there really no repeaters all along this whole entire route? I really doubt it. All right, so this is one of my issues with the repeater book. It doesn't; it's not 100% inclusive, so you still have to do a little bit of research on your own. All right, it's a great place to start, but it's not the end of all means. All right, so so let's do before we go back over here to the repeater page. 
um, we're going to do, we're going to look at the statewide simplex frequencies here, and we're going to input one of these frequencies, one of these simplex frequencies into both the FT60 and the FT70. All right, so I'm going to switch over to the overhead cam. Now, I apologize for the overhead cam. The, uh, the overhead camera is one of those cheap uh, uh, knockoffs of the uh, GoPros. The, the zoom is not really 100% well. It's, it's not really that great of a camera, and I'm going to have to replace it one of these days. Um, but we're going to choose a frequency here. Um, we'll, we'll do 146.480. All right. So I'm going to switch over. Here's the... All right, so here's the radio, okay, and I, I do apologize because my antenna kind of gets in the way. Um, I'll adjust a little bit more on this camera so we can get the, the, the screen part here, all right, and the, uh, the keypad. All right, so on top of here, you've got the, the, the volume knob, and then you got the frequency knob, all right. Comes up, okay, so now I was on my 443.500, which is my hotspot. Uh, simplex frequency. Um, my hotspot is not set up to do uh, FM, but I have my FT70 set on the exact same frequency, and if I key this up, KE7VLC, so you can hear it coming out on the other side over there, all right? So we know it works. We know that the radio works. Everything works, all right? So now doing a simple simplex frequency from the keypad is as simple as one, four, six, eight, zero, zero. Okay. Now notice that the screen comes up and it's got a, a T and a minus sign there. That means it's set up to do a, and we'll hit the squelch because it's picking up all the other, other interference here. Okay. So what that means is it was already set up to do a repeater on that specific frequency, but we don't want to do a repeater here. So how to turn this off is you come back over here to the keypad, you hit the FW button, and then the repeater button. Okay, comes into here. Now you adjust this until it hits off, and then you hit the push to talk button. Notice that T has gone now. All right, the T is gone. We're still left with the minus, though. So we hit the function button again, okay, and we hit the squelch type. It's tone, so we can back that off and turn it off. Now it's gone. Don't worry about the little save light. That just means that my radio is in battery saver mode, so it doesn't drain the batteries all that much. And it is in FM, as we can see right over there. So now, 146.80, that's a simplex frequency. You see how easy that is? Not that hard, not that difficult. All right, we're going to switch over to the FT70, and I apologize, I have my longer whip on my FT70. All right, so one, four, six, eight, zero, zero. Boom, done, right? One, four, six. Oh, look, there's the T and the minus sign. Oh, gee, we already know exactly how to turn that off. Function. And I gotta find the repeat. Repeater is the zero button. Nope, I didn't do it fast enough. So if I do function, go back into the repeater, twist the knob until I'm in simplex, or I have repeater plus, or I have repeater minus. So I hit simplex, hit the button, that goes away. So now we gotta remove the, the tone, and that is going to be. So function, code, oops, not code, I'm sorry, uh, oh, squelch type. See, there we're back at tone, go to off, and now it's off. Now if I was to transmit KE7VLC testing one, two, three. So we know it works, all right? That's the simplex frequency. Now you've seen it on both the FT70 and the FT60. Doesn't take too very. It doesn't take very long now, does it? That's such of a nice feature, all right? That's why I like these radios. They're easy to program, all right? So 
So now let's talk about repeaters. Repeaters are going to have, obviously have a transmit and a receive. Okay, so let's go in here and let's look at, all right, we're going to do one that I might be able to hit um, off of usury pass. Um, we'll do the 145.490. I'm not 100% sure if I'm going to be able to hit that repeater or not from inside my house. Uh, especially with a little rubber duck antenna, but we're going to see what happens here. Okay, we're going to switch back over. Okay, so um, now that we've set, we want one, four, five. Uh, let me find it again. Four, nine, zero. Okay, it's in there. Notice it has the minus sign in there. Okay, because it already knows that it's going to need the minus. If you look back over here, and I wish I had a highlight key, but um, if you look at this, on the usury pass, the KC7WYD repeater, the N7LOQ Radio Aficionados de Arizona, and I'm sorry if I butcher the Spanish there, but it's Radio Aficionados de Arizona. <laughs> hope that, hope that uh, settles that. Um, anyways, you notice... That there's a 145.490 with a minus sign at the end of it. But you also notice one other key feature here is the PL tone, 107.2. All right, now most of these other ones, like if I was to go this one right here, uh, this 146.660 up on Usury Pass, which is a fusion repeater, um, has a 162.2 PL tone. And I'll show you how to program that in there as well, but I want to go with the, the other one because my radio automatically usually picks up the 1622. I just want to be able to show you how to change it, all right? So you notice that it's got a zero. If you look down here lower, let's say this white tank's one here, 147040, you notice there's a plus sign right next to it. The plus sign is because the shift goes the opposite direction. So the negative means that the transmit signal is going to be lower down lower than what the receive frequency is the plus sign means it's going to be higher than what the receive frequency is so let's go back in here let's go right back to our radio affection autos and we're going to program the 145.490 repeater in here and we've already put it in We've already recognized that the fact that the radio already sees that there's a repeater of a negative offset on there. So now what we're going to do is we're now going to go back to repeater. Okay, now this is where you set the plus or minus, and in here we can go off. So we already know that it's a, it's a minus, so we just have to push, push the talk button for just a moment. Now we hit the uh, yeah uh, it's the function squelch type so a function SQL type okay and we change that to be tone all right now the other one is tone squelch we can do reverse in we can do DCS off everything is pretty much tone in here okay we hit the, the button so now the little T comes on. But there's one more thing that we need to worry about, and it's the PL tone. Okay, so now if you hit the function button, which is the bottom key right here, the little function button, and then you hit the two button, the code, up pops this. Now we just spin this until we find the actual PL tone that we want, which was 107.2, and we hit the function button. Now, if we hit the function and that code button, it's going to be in there. So let's give this a shot and see what happens. KE7VLC, testing one, two, three. Uh, can I get a signal report? Now, I don't know if any... Oh, and we hear the repeater coming back. Okay, so I actually did manage to hit the repeater. Now, nobody came back, but that's all right. At least I know that with this little rubber duck antenna, this is basically a stock antenna, I can hit that repeater from inside my house with this little FT60R. All right. So let's do the exact same thing with the FT70. All right. 
it's basically the exact same method. I love this. One, one, four, five, four, niner, zero. And notice, if you notice, got the little minus sign in there. Yay. Okay, well, at least we know now. So now we do, ooh, where is it? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm late. Uh, let's see here. Function and zero is the repeater. So we already have that set. We don't have to worry about that. And now what we need to do is function. Okay, that's for the power. I hit the wrong button. I'm sorry. My fat fingers here. Function five. Oh. Function button. And then we rotate to tone. Okay. Now we need to do the code. So function code. And we know it's not 162, it's 107.2. So we have to dial it down to the 1.7.2. And then we go back to, okay, KE7VLC testing 123. Uh, is there anybody out there that can give me a signal report? And again, I might not necessarily be hitting the repeater all that well either. So, so obviously I am hitting the repeater because I just tried it again and I am hitting it. All right, because you notice by transmit, KE7VLC testing. Uh, anybody out there can give me a signal report? Okay, and the green means that I'm hitting it. So nothing heard, KE7VLC clear. So I'm hearing it. I'm actually making the repeater um, so that was successful. So now you know how to program a repeater and a simplex frequency into the FT60 and the FT70. Quick, easy, painless. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about all the different types of repeaters we have out there. We have something called a linked system. I love linked systems because it allows your little HT, little 5 watts, to be able to reach further distances through the use of multiple different repeaters. I am usually on the Metro link most of the time. If you come on here to the Arizona repeaters.net and you look for the uh, linked repeaters, there's going to be one for the Metro link. This is the one that I recommend new hams program in um, primarily because it is used quite a bit. There are a lot of people who monitor this. Um, there's quite a few different, there's one at, uh, quite a few different repeaters. There's one at Scottsdale Air Park. There's one up at Mingus Mountain. Uh, there's one at Usury Pass, one on Mount Ord, one on Shaw Butte, and one up at Daisy Mountain. Um, these are all in here. They're all linked to each other, meaning that if you come in, say you're near Daisy Mountain, and you transmit into Daisy Mountain, Somebody over at Scottsdale Air Park is going to hear you. Somebody over at Usury Pass is going to hear you. Somebody near Mount Ord is going to hear you. Um, your transmission comes out at every single one of these locations. Now keep that in mind, too. If you're carrying on a long QSO with somebody um, and you're here in the local town, you might want to use a different repeater or something like that. Um, or you might be mindful of others and don't like immediately transmit. I, I, I catch myself every once in a while doing this, especially on my, uh, uh, as I transit the valley to, uh, to work. Um, I'll be on uh, the Metro link and as soon as somebody on keys, you know, is done talking, I usually jump back on there and I never ever give it enough time in there for somebody to break in or anything like that. Um, don't be shy. If you hear two people talking, throw your call sign out there. And the reason why is because most people understand that they're on a linked repeater system. And so if somebody butts in or something like that, they're going to be a little bit more on the mindful aspect and the, uh, the, the common courtesy of being able to say, yes, go right ahead or step on in, have fun with us. Come on, talk with us. What's your name? Where, where are you at? Things of that nature. Hams like to know each other. All right. 
that's the one key thing uh, about this. So if you're if you have mic fright, don't be afraid of it. Get out there. Nobody's gonna bite you. Um, there might be people who might criticize you or give you grief about what radio you're using, or they might get upset because you you have wires turned on or something of that nature. And they shouldn't really be upset about it. They should actually try to educate you as much as possible. Um, here's another system that I recommend for every uh, new ham is the Rimlink uh, system. This one is by far probably the most utilized uh, other than the ears system, uh, which is a whole different group. But um, the Rimlink system, I think, is probably the used the most uh, because it, it goes from Flagstaff all the way down to, uh, I think I can even get it down into Tucson every once in a while off of Pinal. Uh, but Casa Grande gets it. Uh, Apache Junction gets it. I, I get it all the time over here. Um, this is another good one to actually have programmed in here. Um, it goes all the way over to uh, um, Greens Peak, which is over near, um, gosh, I think it's Springerville uh, and Sholo area. So this one covers a lot of ground, and that's what I mean by uh, I love link systems is because it does co cover a lot of ground. Um, there's no, you know, I could talk to somebody up in Flagstaff, and I'm down here in Apache Junction, so you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, here's the ears link system. This one's another big one. I mean, this one goes from, uh, I want to say New Mexico, possibly even Texas, all the way up to Sh uh, Sholo area. Uh, out here in Apache Junction, I get into it. Um, this one is a big, big, big one. Um, uh, obviously, the future planned coverage will be I-40 in the north of the Mexican border and the Continental Divide in New Mexico, west of Tucson and Phoenix. So this is this is a big one here. Um, notice they all have the same PL tone. And the reason why a lot of linked systems have the same PL tone is so that you don't forget it. You just only have to remember that one PL tone and, and that's it. Again, the whole entire Ronco method here, you know, set it and forget it. Um, here's the Monte Copa system. Um, I don't use this one too much, uh, mostly because it's uh, on the west side of town. Um, but it's uh, it goes into yeah, it goes over into um, Kingman and uh, the west side of uh, Arizona. Um, here's the Calzona link system goes into California, uh, Arizona west into California. A great great system if you're over near that section of uh, Arizona and you can get get any of these. My recommendation is do it. I mean white tanks, come on, you guys can hit white tanks. I probably can hit white tanks from here. Um, I've never tried it. Probably should. Um, not going to hit it on the HT, though. I know that for sure. Um, then you got the North Link system. Um, I don't know too much about this one. Um, I, I guess, well, here's the answer here. The system has become much smaller over the years, mostly because those few who have maintained the system have become become unable to maintain the site. So here's here's some other ones. Like if you're going to go into Las Vegas, here's uh, here's all the Las Vegas, Arizona border um, frequencies uh, and repeaters. You know, feel free to peruse this. Um, I, I love this site. This is probably, the, I have this bookmarked here on my home computer at my work, um, on my notebooks uh, or uh, my laptops and my notebooks and notepads. I have this site uh, bookmarked, and I highly recommend you do the same. So I know I said I was going to keep this short, and I've been running this for over an hour now. <laughs> That's short in my term, I guess. Uh, <laughs> at least it's not two hours. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I'm going to sign off now. I'm going to say 73. Hope you guys all have a wonderful day. Um, if you've got comments, uh, other repeaters that you want people to look at, you know, feel free to chime in down below. Um, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Subscribe! Subscribe, please, please, please. The more that we have subscribed, um, also make sure that you have your alert set up so that anytime we post a video to the, uh, to the YouTube, it'll automatically ding you and let you know that we've uploaded a video. Um, questions, comments, feedback. Uh, how is my audio? How is my video? Um, what else would you like to see? If you've got uh, a project that you would like to see, 
Um, notice on uh, my overhead camera, I've got this nice little, I, this is actually um, tile. Uh, I had a friend who was doing some tile work and had a couple left over, so I grabbed one. Um, it's great for when I do uh, soldering and stuff. Um, I won't melt the table. My, my table right now is plastic, so <laughs> it's one of those cheap little foldable plastic tables I get at Walmart. So um, don't be afraid to leave any comments, uh, criticism, feedback. Um, you know, I know my, my face is ugly, so, you know. <laughs> Anyways, hope you guys um, have a good day. Um, don't be too afraid. I'll talk to you later. 73, this is KE7VLC for Whiskey Mike 7 Romeo Charlie, signing out.